All right, well, good morning, and thank you all for being here today. Um, my name is Talia Dubovi, and I am the Associate Director of the Global Health Policy Center here at CSIS. Um, before joining CSIS, I uh, spent several years on Capitol Hill handling um, national security and foreign affairs work where this question of the protection of health and humanitarian workers was a theme that ran through much of what I did. So I'm very happy to be here moderating this panel this morning. Um, before we start, I want to note that this is the first of two panels this morning focused on health. The second will be next door at 11, uh, focused on the U.S. response to the Ebola crisis in West Africa. Um, we are here this morning for a discussion on health and security in fragile states and dangerous places. The, in 2013, 155 humanitarian aid workers were killed, 171 were injured, and 134 were kidnapped. Uh, these numbers represent a 66% increase over 2012. Our panelists here today will discuss what this means for governments, international organizations, and NGOs' ability to effectively carry out humanitarian responses. Uh, what does this increasing violence mean for recruitment, training, protection, retention, and care of humanitarian and health workers? And what more can or should be done to provide adequate protection for this critical, critical work? Uh, we have a terrific group of panelists with us today. Um, I want to note that Gail Smith from the National Security Council sends her regrets. She was called away at the last minute, so even though she is listed in your program, uh, she unfortunately will not be here this morning. Um, I will give a brief introduction of our three panelists, and then I will turn it over to them for opening brief opening remarks. Uh, we will follow that by a short discussion up here, and then I'm going to open it up to the audience for questions. Nancy Lindborg is the Assistant Administrator for the Democracy, Conflict, and Humanitarian Assistance Bureau at USAID. In that role, she has led the Bureau's response to the Arab Spring, the war in Syria, the droughts in the Sahel and the Horn of Africa, and numerous other global crises. Before joining USAID, Nancy spent 14 years as the head of Mercy Corps, where she was instrumental in building a globally respected organization known for innovative programs in the most challenging environments. Bruce Ashaya Chauvet is a physician with broad experience and expertise in international public health and humanitarian action. He is the former head of the Health Division of the International Committee of the Red Cross and former head of the Health Department of the International Federation of the Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies, the only person to have held both those positions. He is currently the medical advisor, advisor for the ICRC's Healthcare and Danger Project. And Jason Cohn is communication director for Doctors Without Borders, or MSF. He has overseen crisis and advocacy communications campaigns for MSF ranging from the Haiti earthquake and cholera epidemic to global childhood malnutrition and HIV AIDS. He recently conducted a risk assessment and analysis in South Sudan and Myanmar for MSF's Medical Care Under Fire campaign. Um, as I mentioned, I have asked each of our panelists to provide brief opening remarks, three to five minutes, um, and once they've all spoken, we will turn to the, to the discussion. Um, and with that, I will turn things over to Nancy to get started. Great, thanks, Talia. Um, and uh, great to see everybody, and I can tell by looking out that there are number of you who have your own deep experience in, in working in insecure environments. Um, and you know, this is a conversation that has been going on for certainly the 20 years that I've been doing this work. Um, and for a number of those years, we used to comfort ourselves by saying, but yes, in fact, car accidents still account for the greatest number of deaths among aid workers uh, working around the world. And I think what we've seen at least in my experience, and I think the data suggests that, that the last couple of years we have seen a qualitative shift, um, probably both in the intensity and the scope and the complexity of the crises uh, where humanitarian and health workers are called upon to provide assistance. And as I look across the globe and see a roster of crises that include uh, South Sudan, Central Africa Republic, Syria, Iraq, Somalia, Myanmar, and uh, a, in, in a different sort of threat environment, West Africa, Ebola crisis. Um, you know, w we are seeing an uptick in not just working in dangerous environments, but absolute targeted attacks on healthcare workers. And Syria, I think, really hit a high watermark in terms of the, the way in which first the regime, and now we're seeing with some of the terrorist actors, Healthcare workers and humanitarian aid workers are absolutely targeted, and the, the numbers of those who were killed uh, continue to rise, and we're seeing a lot of um, unmistakable evidence of clinics being targeted, 
uh, by bombs uh, so that both the healthcare workers and the people that they're treating um, become immediate victims. We also have seen in the past 12 months in the Central Africa Republic, there have been uh, about 50 specifically targeted attacks uh, on humanitarian workers. And so, you, you know, what used to be the kind of more uh, negotiable uh, crisis environment where there was always the threat of kidnapping and one needed to be able to negotiate among various armed actors uh, has shifted so that, in fact, sometimes healthcare workers, uh, humanitarian workers, are in fact the specific target. And this is something that we've, um, I think all of us need to pay very close attention to. I want to note um, both, just two things. The first is um, the way in which at AID we are uh, shifting how we think about the, the, the cadre, the people who go out there. And there's been a, a year-long effort inside AID um, to have a much closer look at the kind of training that we provide our people, and actually not just the humanitarian side of the house, but even the development actors who are increasingly called to work in, in environments that are more dangerous. Um, you know, think Libya or Somalia or DRC, and provide a, a, a heightened level of training so that they have the tools, they have what they need to be able to stay safer, and also for the care component for when people come back from very high threat environments. We've put a lot of investment into staff care, into the kind of counseling that helps people um, better prepare, be better prepared um, and better counseled upon their return. Um, uh, on the program side, we're increasingly looking at the kind of programs that we need to be able to do in high threat environments that have a different kind of footprint and a different kind of profile. And I would just flag Somalia was a really important example of that. And we saw during that famine when you still had al-Shabaab um, holding large swaths of territory that in many cases people just could not get in. Very few internationals could penetrate very far into that country. And yet we were seeing famine indications on the rise. So we really pivoted to an approach that relied heavily on use of market forces both in terms of, of using traders to bring food in and, uh, and so providing increased supply into the markets, while we also enabled through uh, cash vouchers to create uh, the ability for people to purchase from the markets. So it really w it modeled a very different approach for how to provide a market-based humanitarian assistance where you had uh, such constrained access. <coughs> um, and then, and, and we're also having to look at all the ways in which you can do monitoring and evaluation in environments where you do not necessarily have access. And we've seen a number of our partners really uh, push the frontier in places like Syria, uh, using barcodes, for example, to track where items go um, so that there's some understanding of, of uh, the aid is in fact reaching the people you need it to greater reliance on technologies. Um, however, I would say that I am struck by, and it may be given how many crises we have going on right now, that we have, I believe, a shrinking cadre of both organizations and people who are willing and able to go into these very tough environments. And uh, those who do have the skill set and the systems, the familiarity with working in high threat environments, right now are pretty stretched. Um, the Ebola crisis uh, has added to that, particularly given the, the pull on healthcare workers and the threat specifically uh, to healthcare workers in that environment. Um, I'm seeing that we don't have the pipeline of humanitarian workers that we really need uh, to meet global demand. And I believe all of us will need to have um, a continued focus on how to ensure that we have not just enough health uh, healthcare and humanitarian workers, but the kind who are trained and ready and willing to work in those environments and do so with different approaches uh, and in close partnership with um, those who are really on the front lines, which are usually the community members, local NGOs, you know, leaders of those of those countries. So great, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. So um, thank you very much for
inviting the ICRC to this uh, important event. Uh, um, as uh, described, you know, the pattern of uh, attacks on healthcare workers is, uh, is became such an issue that the ICRC decided to, to have a big study called the 16 country study, which they took place between 2008 and 2010. At the end of which, the International Conference of the Red Cross and states um, which have signed the Geneva Convention gave the mandate to the ICRC to lead a project called Healthcare in Danger with a very simple objective, um, improve delivery and security of effective and impartial health um, in situation of conflict and other emergencies. But this very simple objective, as we know, has different components that are quite intricate and complicated. Um, the fact that uh, we, we have problems is obvious. We, we, we know all of that. And uh, even if we don't have a baseline uh, that can prove and give a trend, no one today will contest the fact that it's a very important problem. Violence against healthcare workers has to stop. And to be well understood, we don't need any set of new laws. We just need to implement what exists already. Um, in 2012, I was based in Beirut, and I was receiving regularly visits from doctors coming from Damascus, and one of them told me that, uh, for him, it was more dangerous to be arrested uh, with a Kalashnikov in his car compared to a dressing kit. Because a Kalashnikov, everybody will understand that he's trying to defend himself. With a dressing kit, he will be maybe treating someone from the opposition. I think uh, this, as such, is uh, quite a worrying uh, trend. More recently, we've seen that uh, during the Ebola crisis, healthcare providers coming to help uh, people have been killed, um, and uh, lack of information at the community level was obviously at stake. Um, we, we gather evidence, we, gather, we continue gathering incidents, but uh, I just want to say that ICRC publishes on a yearly base um, uh, incidents that are coming from 23 different delegations. But we know that this is not representative as such as the reality. But at least it helps people to understand what are the different patterns happening in the field. Um, we've got military, politicians, health professionals, volunteers from national societies gathering in 11 workshops, came out with a lot of recommendations. All of them are now available. Um, a few examples. We, we cannot prevent military entering into a health facility. This, by experience, we know that's not possible. But what we can do is make sure that in the standard operational procedures of uh, military that they bring medical people with them just to make sure that they are not going to disturb everything inside uh, the, the hospital. We know that fighting can also happen around hospital. We've been talking to military people to see how we could, with their support, trying to limit the consequences for healthcare providers. Um, sometimes also we know that uh, families, armed groups, are trying to push for their own patients. They don't care about who is treated already. They want their patients to be treated. And uh, we are also working with, um, in different contexts, to see how we can adjust the perimeter around the hospital to avoid such incidents. The question um, we, we see more and more is the difficulty to balance access and security. You know, we need to access the victims, but also there are con places in which the second blast is, uh, is a current practice. So, how do you balance the security of healthcare providers coming to support and help if you know that the second blast is possible? We've seen also and had a lot of discussions on 
perception and acceptance from the communities themselves. I gave the example of Ebola, but not only for Ebola, uh, how communities are accepting the people to come and help. In this perspective, religious leaders have been, um, we, we've had interesting discussions with religious leaders in, in West Africa, trying to, to, to put healthcare in danger in between Islamic jurisprudence and uh, uh, international humanitarian law. To conclude this uh, short presentation, I just want to give you three key messages. Um, we've been working through this project with a large variety of interlocutors. Um, we've been working with MSF, we've been working with uh, Safeguarding Health in Conflict, World Medical Association, International Council of Nurses, and many more. All of them keen to work together to change the reality in the field. Because at the end of the day, if we want to make a change, it's not going to be in this room. It's going to be at the country level. Just to make sure that the, the, the people we bring interested to this process work together at the field level. My second uh, point will be to say, let's avoid to concentrate only on hopeless cases. We know them. We know how difficult they are. And uh, we have to bear in mind that there are several countries today that have managed to have a real change. I usually mention the example of Colombia, but Colombia is not alone. Afghanistan, um, Central African Republic, there, there are places in which people are trying to make a difference. So don't go only for the hopeless cases. And finally, um, in the set of recommendations we have, uh, um, we, we see that a lot of the recommendations are on prevention, training, universities, research. No one has a magic bullet to solve the problems we have today in the field. We need to look at them together and um, develop evidence for decision makers to show that violence and health, they don't work together. It, if we want to make a change, we need to work together on that. Thank you very much. So uh, thank you to uh, CSIS for having MSF here today. Um, try not to repeat some of the, the very good points that both Nancy and Bruce have made so far. Um, you know, we had the same sort of questions uh, as an organization operating in conflict, operating in crisis zones, and we expect that this is the, this is the environment we work in. It's going to be dangerous. Uh, we need to accept levels of risk. We need to measure them. We need to respond to them and adapt to them. Um, uh, and we couldn't you know, empirically state, were things, are things worse today than they were before? But certainly, um, I think the, the key thing that we have to recognize is in, the, in those are most acute crises, the Central African Republics, the South Sudans, the Syrias, um, there is a huge lack of assistance reaching the people that, uh, that need it most. Uh, and in our case, we feel very strongly also about the, the provision of direct medical care to those victims of violence uh, in those conflict zones. Um, and really our aim in sort of carrying out our own work uh, under the umbrella of medical care under fire, which has been you know, really uh, helped by the discussions with the ICRC, was to understand not just sort of really uh, quantitatively speaking, you know, how many incidents were happening, uh, what, you know, where were those threats coming from in the different places that were working, but how at the end of the day, how is that influencing and affecting access to medical care for patients? Um, you know, if you have a hospital that's still being able to run, but patients aren't able to access it, are you really fulfilling your mission of what you're trying to do in terms of providing uh, access to medical care? So we've taken a, sort of a qualitative approach of looking at uh, a number, a wide range of diverse cases of countries that we work in. So everything from uh, CAR, as I just mentioned, South Sudan, Honduras, uh, city inside Tripoli in Lebanon, uh, a somewhat divided city. Um, we're also looking at in Myanmar, um, as well as the Congo, Kibera slum in Kenya, and really just trying to understand uh, where are these threats coming from, how are they manifesting, and how at the end of the day um, are they impacting uh, the medical care we're able to provide. Um, I've done some of that work myself uh, in South Sudan and Myanmar recently in the last year. It's been carried out by other members of our teams uh, across the, some of those different countries that I mentioned. And I think what's interesting that we've learned so far, and we're still very much in the processing uh, part of this, uh, this reflection, this analysis, is, is that 
um, the severity of incidence isn't necessarily correlated directly with the loss of access to health care. Um, the level of violence that our teams deal with on a day in and day out basis in the Central African Republic, we're able to still operate, albeit under very difficult conditions. Uh, military personnel, uh, state, non-state actors entering facilities with weapons, threatening staff, threatening to take out and sometimes killing patients inside facilities. The same has been sort of happened over the last uh, 10 or 11 months in South Sudan since the, the restart of the conflict there. Um, but even before that, before the conflict started, we had issues of, of trying to ensure the access to impartial medical care in an environment where you had intercommunal violence uh, unfolding. Uh, and uh, medical facilities not necessarily respected um, and a very difficult and fast sort of moving environment. Uh, juxtapose that with a place like Yemen where of course there's always going to be difficulties and challenges dealing with uh, different, different armed groups there but also principally what we found is that there is a, a lot of tension around sort of the respect for the medical profession itself um, and how families view whether or not the quality of care that's being provided to their family members and that oftentimes leading to uh, violence taking place inside hospitals um, or issues with ambulances. And in some ways, that spilling over to uh, a really an impact on how medical care is provided in terms of the ideas of uh, treating people based on need or medical triage, you know, trying to influence who gets treated first. And also just playing out as a fear amongst, uh, amongst the doctors and some of our national staff colleagues about you know, do we take this patient, do we treat this patient, do we refer them to another structure? and sort of an almost absurd, absurd situation where no one wants to declare a patient dead because of the ramifications of what that would mean uh, and what level of care you're able to provide. Um, then juxtaposed that with some of the issues that many of you may be aware of in Myanmar, where um, uh, we are trying to, uh, as an organization, have not been able to work in, uh, in Rakhine State uh, since February when we were uh, expelled by the, the government in that part of the country and we're still working to try and try and get back in there. But even in the lead up, even before that expulsion took place, um, we faced a lot of challenges from the community which stem from a lack of acceptance of providing medical care to one side or the other. Um, and that doesn't necessarily manifest itself in direct physical violence towards international staff per se, but more arguably sinister ways of undermining the ability to provide medical care. Drivers are being threatened so they can't, we can't maintain referral services. Uh, you know, landlords being threatened so you can't maintain teams in the areas where you need to provide care. Um, all sorts of the infrastructure underneath it, but, and which eventually leads to when combined with certain policies that are put in place, not being able to provide medical care to the people who you're trying to provide. So um, I can't go, I can tell you a laundry list of security incidents in South Standard Car, yet we're still able to operate in those environments. Yet in Myanmar, you juxtapose that where Arguably, the level of violence has been less, but the ability to provide health care has been diminished significantly in the places where we want to provide it. So um, I think it's interesting to understand these environments, because at the end of the day, aid agencies, they work in specific environments. Global trends are interesting, but they don't tell us that much about what we need to do to be adaptable to what the changing environment is. Um, and also, I think, you know, um, I think you've given some nice uh, examples, Nancy, of how organizations are trying to sort of adapt and provide uh, assistance in some of these areas. It's tricky, I think, for us in, as a medical organization trying to provide that direct hands-on care, which we think is so core to our identity of providing care, and that's how we see our accountability, is that we know who we're treating and the patients that we're treating, and we're treating them as partially as possible um, based on need. So that requires, you know, really talking to everyone, talking to low-level commanders at checkpoints all the way up the chain of the command. And what we, I think we've learned and we've known, and this isn't something recent, this has been true for as long as we've been uh, working in these environments, is that the guarantees you get at a local level or a very high level, even obviously at the very highest level of a, of a state or an opposition group, uh, doesn't necessarily translate into what happens on the field. Um, you need to be able to have good level contacts and networking all the way up the chain of the command and with communities as well. Um, I think in South Sudan it's been interesting for us to understand some of the most interesting things that I learned were through from anthropologists, understanding the different dynamics around who controls and who has some sense of control on, on monopoly on violence that happens in communities and environments. Um, that manifests very differently sometimes between one ethnic group or tribe to another. Uh, understanding those dynamics. They're not always hierarchical, and they're oftentimes very different social structures that you need to engage with. Um, I'll just end with, so I think 
uh, in many ways, what we're looking at is it's really not necessarily innovation per se, but back to the basics of what trying to do. Uh, all these places that we're talking about here, there's a huge disconnect between the amount of need and the aid provided. And we really strongly think, I think, as MSF, is that emergency response, that's our core business, and that's what we really need uh, aid agencies to be working on and trying to, to focus most of their efforts on. And that requires that networking, that understanding, that dialogue, continued uh, effort to, to, to reach and talk to all different levels uh, of the different people that we have to deal with those environments. Um, at a state level, I think, as, as what Bruce was alluding to, is it requires the states recognize that uh, uh, all, the, all the sort of principles are there. They're in, a, in a international humanitarian law. They're in the Geneva Conventions. We don't necessarily need new treaties, new protocols, new things. Those basics are there. They're on paper. Governments have agreed to adhere to them. We need uh, other actors to respect them. And we also need to just re respect the independent and impartial care uh, you know, aspects and nature of medical care. Uh, regardless who it's provided to and in what environments, uh, and that's really important that we get sort of back to basics and acknowledgement of that. So I'll just leave it there. Great. Thank you all. Um, you've given us uh, a lot to discuss. Um, I want to pick up on the on the last one of the last points you made, Jason, is the the point that risk mitigation is a very location specific activity, um, and I'm wondering if you could each talk a little bit about how you get the knowledge you need to go into each of those communities. And it's not just each country, it's each area, it's each village, it's each town, it's each tribe. Um, and whether or not you need, now that you're seeing possibly these shifts in targeting of workers, do you need different partners? Do you need better information? And do you have the ability to get what you need to do your work? Um, so, I think you really need both. You need the generalized information and you need the ability to apply it in, I absolutely agree with Jason, very, very specific situations. And it, you know, I think what we've seen over and over again is that oftentimes in these big conflicts, and I'm thinking of Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, you have opportunities to more deeply engage at the community level before the violence becomes more difficult to get more people in, more internationals. And it's critical that you form those community networks uh, to get that community acceptance that is really the backbone of being able to operate in some of these areas, um, even if you're not able to be there in the same, at, at the same levels of, of personnel. It, it is very different when you're trying to provide care using some of the models that I think MSF does versus uh, a, a model that is supporting local actors. Um, and so you do have to differentiate the kind of assistance that you're providing. Um, but that local knowledge, that really specific understanding of, of individuals and dynamics is key. One of the things that we've been doing um, for about a, a, a decade, if not more, is supporting uh, the NGO security networks. And these are the networks, there's one in Afghanistan, there's one in Syria, I think there's one um, in, in a lot of these high threat environments where it's an opportunity to share that level of localized, highly contextual information um, real time among all the actors. And you know, I've seen personally how this works, um, where say you're driving from one city to the next, you, you check through this network of everybody's security officers so that you can see exactly what's happening on the road ahead, or you can check on who the key actors are in a particular community. And I think that's been a very important development that brings additional sophistication to the operations, both of local knowledge, but also of, of at any moment, the security environment. Well, <clears throat> I think we can spend all day talking about risk mitigation, <laughs> but, um, I think uh, maybe what what will be interesting to say is, is first of all, um, because the the patterns of conflict have changed, uh, you you have also a, a different set of interlocutors, and in some parts of the world it became very complicated. You, as you know, uh, I think as uh, all of us, you 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 want to make sure that uh, first of all you. You don't uh, risk anything for the people you send to the field, as well as for the patients you're trying to to, uh, to treat. And uh, to to get there, you you need to work on the image you you, you give. So 
uh, people need to understand what means independence, what means impartiality, what means the fact that you're not there to be, uh, you know, sided. And uh, so it is sometimes also a bit complicated. I agree that we have to, to work with uh, local NGOs, but uh, some of them uh, uh, will be felt as part of one, one side. And uh, so, you know, we, we have, um, through the project, we have uh, a book on responsibilities of health personnel in which we try to explain very simply to health care providers, you know, what are your rights and responsibilities in case of a conflict, in case of an emergency? And this alone, I think, helps people to uh, provide a, a positive image of healthcare providers in, in, the, in, the sense of, in the sense of the needed impartiality. And I think this is really, to me, a key element of whatever happens in the field to uh, develop risk mitigation. I, I, if I may, just um, we we know a, lo a lot in the field, you know, uh, talking to, to people at the ground level. That's not, not necessarily well known at the global level. Sometimes all of us, we are a kind of link in the information that is provided at the global level from what we understand at the local level. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's in terms of the risk mitigation, it's really uh, a really open and transparent dialogue of what your intentions are as an aid organization and, and for MSF. It's, it's the, you know, how that we're gonna offer care to everyone, we're gonna treat people in, in many environments. It, it requires a real explanation of kind of keeping weapons out of the, out of the hospital and, and that we'll treat people based on need through a, a strict adherence to sort of medical triage. And I think it's sort of making sure that your operations and your rhetoric are aligned, right? That you're doing everything you can to reach populations on however many sides of a conflict uh, uh, they may be. Um, I think, uh, and also just from a, from a personnel, from a training standpoint is, uh, at least for us, I think it's really been a reaffirmation of that while obviously there is a, a command and control in terms of who makes decisions about when teams are, are reduced, uh, operations suspended, teams evacuated in certain cases, um, that everyone in the team has a responsibility around the question of security. Um, that this isn't just something we delegate to somebody else or a specialist within uh, a co coordination team, uh, that there, everyone plays a role. And obviously, the link with our national staff is absolutely so critical to that, to understanding the environment and whether or not what the risks are, whether we're uh, whether we're accepted uh, in, in that community. So it's, it's talking at all levels. It could be religious leaders, it could be local community leaders. It's also understanding sometimes how the fact that it, MSF as an organization is gonna come into an area, provide free medical care. What are the economic implications of that, right? Because there are sometimes there, we have seen threats that have come as a result of displacing services that have otherwise been a means of the economy, the health economy for people. And, uh, that contributing to some of the, the dangers that we might face. We've seen that sometimes in Afghanistan um, uh, uh, and other countries as well. So it's really understanding what your, your while your purity of your intentions might be, uh, are very clear, there are implications that you don't necessarily see from the outset in terms of what risk you may or may not face, uh, I think, in an environment, so. Okay, um, just to pull this back a little bit, I mean, risk is an inherent part of these jobs, and so we talk about risk mitigation as opposed to risk elimination. Um, how, how is that, how do you communicate that both to potential employees, I and mean, you mentioned the, the pipeline of, of trained and willing and able people um, to go into these environments, but then how do you also communicate that to your donors um, and your funders, particularly when your funders may be the US Congress, um, and how does that conversation play out? Well, I, I'm continually struck by the lack of focus and awareness of the risks that, that humanitarians face, that there isn't the kind, you, you know, we just celebrated quite importantly Veterans Day yesterday, mm -hmm. but we really need, you know, we have a Humanitarians Day, um, I think it's August uh, 8th. Yeah, it's um, August. But it's not very well known. I mean, I'm even having trouble remembering the date. But, uh, you know, th this really needs to be amplified and celebrated. And we saw a version of this um, just two weeks ago with um, this sudden hysteria around the returning healthcare workers from West Africa. 
And President Obama made a big effort to hold an event at the White House to honor the healthcare workers, to try to change the narrative from one of stigma that these are possible disease carriers to really celebrating and, and recognizing whispering their lips that, that they willingly took, that they volunteered to take. And this is true whether you're fighting Ebola uh, or whether you are uh, providing assistance in Syria or Somalia or you know, any number of the places that we've all named. And so part of that, I think, is that all of us have a duty and a need to elevate that narrative that it is risky and not to pretend that we can mitigate or eliminate and prevent the risk. Um, secondly, and I think this is no secret to anyone in this town, the risk posture that uh, is uh, able to be taken by official Americans has become increasingly constrained. And so therefore, it's even more important to have partners who are willing and able to get out there. I mean, I often say that if I hadn't been to a lot of these places prior to taking the position I have now, I would not have a very clear view of what some of these dynamics are. Because you just, as an official uh, part of the administration, you don't, you don't have the opportunity to get out um, because of the, the risk aversion that we have right now. But without getting out and without taking those risks, we cannot do the job. Uh, you cannot make the difference that is absolutely imperative to be made. And so, you know, we need to sell it. We really, really need to celebrate um, the people who do it. Provide all the training that's possible. Look at all the ways. And I'm really struck. You know, Bruce, you're absolutely right. We don't need new conventions or need new laws. But these are so not understood or respected by a lot of the critical actors. Who, who represent the risk these days. So it's really about what are the strategies, what are the ways in which we can make those more universally understood, respected, and applied. And you know, we keep whacking at it in different ways. AID signed a partnership with, the, with OIC uh, about a year and a half ago and have worked very hard to bring all of the, uh, the um, Islamic NGOs into a dialogue to really elevate and celebrate these laws. And I know that, I, that uh, ICRC regularly provides human rights training for any, uh, any actor that wishes to receive it. You know, so um, and Ambassador Mitchell has been relentless in his negotiations with the, the government um, of Burma to, to enable uh, humanitarian actors to get back to work in Burkine State. But this is, this is, there's no easy answer to this, and this will just take relentless effort. Thanks. There, I think uh, what, 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 what we've discovered with uh, the Healthcare in Danger project, we, I thought at the beginning, you know, it will be well-defined, you know, conflict and other emergencies. But more and more, you know, people are telling me, we have the same problem at home. And when I say home, I'm talking about Spain, France, UK, that there are a lot of countries in which the non-respect for healthcare providers is a real problem. So um, uh, what, what I want to say is that I think the problem we are dealing with today are not only for the others. I think we, we need really to start to look at home, what we can do. And maybe this helps also people, as you said, to understand what are rights, responsibilities, existing laws, what, what has to be applicable. Um, I think we, we need also, um, fortunately for the ICRC, uh, in most of the context in which we work, we have uh, Red Cross and Red Crescent national societies. They are strongly you know, based on the on the ground, and they, they can help us sometimes to really understand and uh, contribute to, to, to limit the risk. Very often, I, I make it the, the comparison between what we do for healthcare in danger and what we do in the prisons. You know, when ICRC visits the prison, we have to talk to the health people in the prison as well as the health director. And of course, the health people, they don't have the same problems as the health director. The director or the government has one objective, which is about security. So you, you need to find ways to bridge the gap between the two. And maybe one way to do it is that to convince a health prison director that to invest in health and in partial health will contribute to security. Okay. 
Yeah, I think uh, one of the things that we've been trying to, to, to do with our work on these different countries is really just to, to practically kind of give examples of what, what works or doesn't work in these different kinds of environments to train our own staff and sort of improve, improve the sort of uh, institutional memory and lessons learned from these places and also share those, those lessons learned, I think, publicly as well as with the rest of the, the medical and aid community. I think one of the things that, uh, you know, some of the things we're seeing and we're learning practically speaking is, is that there are strategies where we can, you know, maintain medical facilities in areas where it is safe. Oftentimes, the cost of that is that those hospitals are serving one segment of the community or one uh, ethnicity, let's say, because they're divided communities and they're actually geographically divided. So like a city like Tripoli in Lebanon, um, where we have clinics that are in the Sunni and Shiite neighborhoods, and the ability for people to cross that and get health care uh, is not really accepted or they themselves don't feel safe. That, you could say the same thing in South Sudan. You could say the same thing probably in Yemen and a lot of places. So there is sometimes a sort of uh, a trade-off between safety and security and be able to provide care and your ability to actually serve everyone. And that, I think that's just, that's just in some ways the reality and the trade-off that uh, we've seen play out time and again, um, you know, regardless of the context and where the threats may come. And that's, that's, I think that's, that's very tricky. I think as you also alluded to, uh, Bruce, the problems at home will not, you know, is in situations of sort of uh, political unrest, how we've seen in a place like Bahrain several years ago where health, you know, basically healthcare facilities became also in some ways prisons or places of interrogation as opposed to places of care. Uh, and the spillover impact of that, of having to, you know, clandestine clinics being set up where so people could go, and, uh, you know, if they were injured and get treatment, and, and no longer seeing those facilities um, as a place to go for care, um, and and what the sort of knock-on effect of that is. But I think you know, we we have a lot we have a lot to learn, a lot a lot to process, and a lot I think to to, sh to share. So bringing different people around the table is something we've tried to do in a number of these different countries we've been looking at. So whether they're ministries of health, whether they're medical associations, whether they're people in the security service, the military, et cetera. I think I see you guys have been doing a lot of that, much more even than we have, proactively engaging members of the, uh, the different militaries in different countries that you've worked in sensitizing them. We also have to expect that in a lot of the places that we're working in, uh, as much as we would wish, that things like IHL are really not viewed necessarily as that legitimate. And so we need to figure out ways to explain uh, our need to provide care and how we provide it in different different language, um, because those are those are policies accepted at the state or an international level, but they don't necessarily resonate when you're talking to a uh, uh, tribal chief of, of the Nuer in northern Jongle State in South Sudan. I mean, we have to be honest, and and they are sort of accepted to a certain degree, a very high level, maybe at opposition or government levels, but uh, when you get down to the brass tacks of implementation on the field. Um, they don't mean much, and it really comes down to the fact that medical care in some cases is viewed as aiding the enemy, and that's something that we have a very difficult time overcoming, uh, that reality. So. Well, let's open it up uh, for questions. I think we have a couple folks running microphones. Um, we'll do two or three at a time, and um, if you can speak into the microphone and say who you are and where you're from before you ask your question. Um, let's start in the middle here and then come up to the front. Uh, Len Rubenstein, I'm from Johns Hopkins, I chair of the Safeguarding Health and Conflict Coalition. And I want to thank all of you for speaking and all the work you're doing uh, on risk mitigation and protection. Uh, but the discussion tends to leave out uh, a different element, which is that we know that indigenous health workers, not necessarily those who are affiliated as local staff with humanitarian groups, are the principal victims. And a lot of these risk mit mitigation strategies won't work. So we have to look at other ways. And in the discussion, one approach is often left out, and that is the monitoring, reporting, accountability mechanisms of the human rights community. Those have expanded recently. WHO is required now to collect data. Security Council has an accountability mechanism under the Children Armed Conflict Mechanism. But it seems to me that that needs to be part of this. We even need criminal accountability, like in Syria, 
But that's very rarely talked about. Now, I understand the constraints of humanitarian groups in sharing data or in calling for those kinds of uh, um, approaches, but I think leaving it out of the conversation is a huge mistake because that's got to be part of the solution. So I welcome your response. Hi, good morning. I um, had a question about a country that we haven't discussed this morning on Pakistan. Um, everyone knows that uh, the KPK province is sort of a black box, um, and I was just wondering what advice you would provide to uh, humanitarian donors and donors um, working in, in, that, uh, in that country, and specifically in that province. All right, why don't we uh, start with those two? Um, Jason, you wanted to jump in on that first one? Yeah, so I, I think um, that's a very good point. I mean, uh, the, the strategy you talk about risk mitigation, yes, they absolutely, we, we can't, there's not a lot we can do for our, our national staff colleagues and, and, and many of the, the Ministry of Health or other workers that are, uh, that are affected by this violence. And uh, a subset of our research that we're doing is specifically directed at trying to understand strategies that we could employ that would help improve the security management for our national staff at MSF. Um, that's work that we've, we've just sort of started in the last few months uh, and involves uh, interviewing numerous staff across a number of countries um, to sort of understand that. Because I think one of the big ethical and moral sort of hazards of all of this is how much of that risk do we devolve to those staff. You know, in a place like Syria where it's almost impossible to have international staff. How much do we, do we put on their shoulders? And at what point do you cross a line at the risk that you're allowing them to accept to do that work um, uh, and the commitment in that? And uh, it's, it's, it's challenging, and I, I absolutely agree. We really haven't figured out how to do that better. Um, outside of the fact that in some places, you know, we're bringing so-called impacts from different parts of the countries and the responsibility we have to kind of bring them back to their, their, where they live in the country. But there's huge limitations um, and a lot of research that needs to be done to understand those starts, I think, more accurately. Yeah, Len, thank you for your, your, your question. Uh, I thought, um, uh, may, maybe I haven't been uh, cleared enough, but the healthcare in danger project is, is not about humanitarian people. The Healthcare in Danger project is about all healthcare providers. And so we know from the data we collect that uh, most of the people affected have nothing to do with ICRC, Red Cross, or even MSF. They, have, they, they are affecting uh, uh, local people. So just to say that the set of recommendations we have are, of course, useful for us and uh, the, the humanitarian family, but they go far beyond this family. Concerning the, your, your, your second point, and uh, uh, I agree on the importance of data collection, and uh, I know of the importance to uh, being able to uh, uh, quantify what, what happens on the ground, especially in Syria. But as I said also, I think uh, Syria should not be a case that is so desperate that we don't look at the rest of the world. So that, that's, that's the message, you know. It's, it's important to stress what's happening there, but not to forget that there are many places in the world in which we can make also a difference. And uh, just to your, your question about Pakistan, ICRC has been a, a few years ago brutally affected, as you know. And since then, we have sharply reduced what, what, what we've been able to do in, in Pakistan, even if we know that Pakistan is definitely a healthcare in danger priority in many sense. Um, I just want to say that uh, nowadays we've had, as a follow-up of the discussions we had with Islamic circles, with Islamic relief organizations. We had recently in Islamabad a big meeting with scholars. In, in that, that's what we can do today. Unfortunately, not enough. 
So I, I wanted to just respond quickly to Len. I think you raise a really important point. And this, of course, is an age-old issue in terms of how to, I mean, a lot of humanitarian organizations have access to a lot of data. But it's, it, we saw in Darfur what happened about seven years ago when a number of groups were kicked out because of suspicion that they were providing information uh, that was relevant to, to The Hague. Um, I think that the question also is it, is it, uh, it, it can act as a deterrent more, more usefully or more frequently. It, it becomes an after the fact um, tool. I think we haven't seen in Syria that it's useful as a protection device because the, there are lots of good reports that are coming out on a regular basis that chronicle exactly how many healthcare workers have been killed, clinics bombed. Um, that data is available and it hasn't detoured either the regime or ISIL. Um, I think it's critical to, to, to collect that and to know that, to publish that. I'm not sure it's actually protecting the lives of, of the very, very courageous medical people who, who are bearing the brunt of a lot of that targeting. But you, you know, this is, this is the ongoing conversation that we all have um, and will continue to have. Just to, to jump a little bit off of the Pakistan question, um, you know, one of the things that I think we've seen over the last decade is a little bit of a blurring of the lines between national security priorities, humanitarian priorities, development priorities. Um, and you know, the, the kind of example that, that comes to mind very quickly is the, the vaccination campaign in Pakistan that led to the bin Laden raid um, and what the fallout was from that for all of your organizations. Um, but you know, Jason, we were talking before this about the, the, the lines between development and humanitarian response. And I'm wondering if each of you could talk a little bit about how you respond, how your organizations are responding to both the mixing of these activities and kind of what you see as the way forward as a lot of these, as you see, as you see a lot of these lines continuing to blur and mix together. So on the, on the relief and development mixing, I mean, I think we need to be just very clear about the environment in which we're working. Um, because uh, I have been a, a significant proponent for the whole concept of re resilience which is fundamentally the idea that when possible, one needs to connect up the relief and development in environments where you want to promote a more durable and a faster recovery and enable communities to be able to bounce back. And that involves investing at you know, the community, at the regional, at the systemic level, um, and use those, those humanitarian dollars to set the stage for, for future um, success. And you need to blur it. I think that communities are not segmented into, okay, now I want emergency help and now I want development help. And so these are false categories that we have developed over the last 50 years as we perfect how we deliver assistance. I, that, that's very different, however, than when you're in a hot conflict zone, when you're trying to navigate armed actors to deliver essential assistance and there's no possibility of moving into um, a, a situation of recovery. You're just, it's just a keeping people alive. And that's a very, very different kind of uh, environment. And you, you know, it may need different actors who specialize in doing that. But we, at our peril, continue to wall off relief from development in all environments over long periods of time. You know, then you have the Hades, where the NGOs were accused of creating years um, that have that didn't lead to any tangible progress um, I will also say since we're titled fragile states um, I take great heart in the, uh, the framework that's developed by the G7 plus for uh, a new deal for engagement with fragile states and it does require th that one understands that to move out of conflict you need to think about uh, investment in things like legitimate politics and in security. And there are, are often countries where there's, there's maybe the political will but not the political capacity. And there's a different kind of engagement that one needs to have in those environments as well. Um, so it, in, my, in my mind, what it comes down to is having a very clear understanding of the context in which you're working and the ability to make the, the appropriate choices based on that. Syria is 
country that, that is uh, you know, still in a very hot crisis zone. However, there are communities in the north that are trying hard to not just, you know, to not lose all of their market capacities um, and ability to have some kind of normal, normal life for their families. Um, again, a question on which we can spend quite some time. Uh, um, maybe, uh, as, as you mentioned, the fragile states, uh, I think uh, the, the definition, you know, of uh, fragile states goes uh, very easily with a fragile system, with a fragile health system. And, and we know, you know, by definition that wh whenever we have to work, and this is what uh, we do usually in most of the places in which we are together, is, uh, is that um, the, the, the link, uh, the lack of investment in health um, that uh, has a consequence on the capacity of the state to react when there is a problem like Ebola or a conflict. So uh, this, you know, this permanent distinction between relief and, and development, I think, has uh, also been quite a big pain for all of us in the field because uh, I think uh, the urgency to develop and to get a resilient system is sometimes much more important than just to respond to, uh, to emergencies. As far as the ICRC is concerned, I just want to say that uh, I think the ICRC wasn't part of uh, the MDG's move in the 2000s, but is certainly now much better positioned to contribute to what will be the post-MDGs, the post-2015, and we see that uh, what we developed through the healthcare in danger or whatever we developed as, as an activities can be a positive contribution to this process. Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, for us as MSF is an emergency medical organization, uh, we're very focused on the emergency response. And I think the tricky thing for us is that we've seen sort of time and again, the inability um, to shift from sort of this interim kind of post-conflict development uh, programming, um, say in the South Sudan, uh, back into very quickly into an emergency response mode. And I think there's a, you know, it, it's a very tricky balance to strike, right, between trying to understand that societies need to develop, they need to move on beyond conflict, and the fact that most of the places uh, in some of those countries like South Sudan or, or CAR, Arguably, there isn't really a state functioning in the vast majority of the country to respond, particularly, at least from our view, to the health needs. Um, and how can we sort of strike a balance between what the work of some organizations are doing uh, with the state when all of a sudden that state becomes an active member of the conflict? Uh, and how do, we, how do we balance that? And how does that have implications for um, how those organizations are perceived, their response capacity? Um, I think there's also a question of, from the donor side, uh, institutional and government donor side, um, uh, is where's the flexibility in sort of trying to strike a balance between the need to be accountable for the dollars provided to organizations to do what they said they're supposed to do in their, in their grants and their contracts and what the needs of the situation at hand require. Um, and that, we've seen that, I mean, we've seen that in Haiti in the cholera epidemic after the earthquake you know, the inability of groups to be able to shift and reprioritize as needs. We're actually seeing that unfolding a bit now, um, even though there's a very large machine moving in response to the Ebola outbreak, is that, you know, what we thought maybe a few weeks ago maybe isn't what we need today. And so how can organizations who are being funded uh, less from private sources, let's say, um, and are more locked in, and understandably publics want to know what those organizations are doing, what they say they're doing. So there's that contractual accountability notion. But if it's not needed uh, as the situation evolves, how do you adjust? And I think, you know, uh, for MSF as an organization who, who largely depends on private sources, you know, w we have some of that flexibility and independence. And I think it's a tricky balance for other organizations. Um, in a place like Afghanistan, we had a, a lot of concerns, you know, of where we were trying to operate, uh, obviously in areas that were controlled by, uh, largely controlled by the Taliban. At the same time, how do you balance that against, um, you know, working with the state who's viewed 
um, and being a part of developing that state for which another side is opposing that same development. Say what you want about the values and the principles of that development, um, there's still an, uh, that question of neutrality, independence, and partiality becomes quite difficult, I think, uh, when you get down to implementation of programs and providing assistance in areas that are not controlled by the government you're helping to develop. So it's, uh, I think it's, it, it poses a lot of, of very difficult practical dilemmas. I think you raise really, really important points, and yeah. I, just a quick response is that you know through USAID's Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance, we have a great deal of flexibility, and in the Ebola response, for yeah. example, there those grants are as flexible as they need to be to enable the shift in the response. Where we have had less flexible uh, 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 ability is in our longer-term mission funding. And so part of the process that AID has been going through for the last year is how to bring that greater flexibility into the longer term funding um, and have experimented with things like the cri uh, this idea of a crisis modifier that you can inject in the middle of a longer term grant the ability to do pivots uh, or even a full on emergency response uh, as the situation changes. Because I think, Jason, you're absolutely right that one critical piece of this is having the adaptability and the flexibility. Because when South Sudan went from being on a development course to all of a sudden the state being a part of the conflict, th everything needed to shift and needed to shift quickly. And so there is definitely, I think, the, the, the requirement for the donor side to be as flexible as these environments require. Are there, there's a question in the back. Wait for the, we've got a webcast, so let's wait for the microphone. Greetings, I'm Thomas Ward. I used to work at the World Bank, and I'm um, heavily involved in healthcare and other aspects. But my biggest concern is the corruption side of it, especially in the grants and the flexibility. If you look, there's a history of corruption and corruption, corruption in mm -hmm. Liberia in particular. And my concern is if you just throw a bunch of money in it, are you just creating a bigger problem afterwards? Um, the World Bank is on notice of you know, corruption projects, but they've hit one person, but now they just go ahead and, you know, continue to disperse on new ones. There's a hand in the front here. Hi, my name is Sheila Murray. I'm with World Vision, and I actually wanted to go back to the comments that you made <clears throat> about the transition from relief to resilience to development in the context of health system strengthening. Just, um, you know, trying to work through that process myself recently and working on what those strategies really look like. And I was wondering if you had any strategies that you would recommend that really do promote sort of that transition. I mean, we have the World Health Organization's six building blocks for health system strengthening. I was wondering if you had any strategies that you've seen that really are effective when you're trying to bridge that gap and, and work on transitioning from a relief healthcare system to something that's more resilient. Thank you. And I will, I'll take a spin on that question before I turn it to, to you guys, but um, in terms of you know, the ability to respond to emergency situations, are you seeing a, an impact on where you already have health systems that are strong for the ability of local folks to respond to crises and um, to be able to keep the lines between uh, you know, what the mission, medical missions might be and the other political and, and crisis environment that's swirling around and, and whether or not that kind of underlying development is gonna be critical for future crisis situations. Sorry. Please. <laughs> um, so to, those are, those are bo both really important issues. On the corruption piece, you know, all of our emergency funding goes through partners, through UN or NGO or you know, local actor partners. So that it's not going through government systems. It does beg the question, however, of how do you, without using the government systems, help them get strong? And that's really the crux of the G7 plus fragile states New Deal question mark. And we have uh, at AID looked at a number of approaches that can create greater transparency and accountability um, through uh, like reimbursement strategies. You, we don't give the money to the Ministry of Health, but they spend the money and we reimburse them. Uh, or uh, also greater um, engagement of your regular citizen. There's a great project in 
uh, Burkina Faso, where just by uh, publicizing which hospitals were getting what amount of money, uh, they suddenly increased the level of service because money had not been getting from the central budget to these hospitals. But when you put that citizen spotlight on it, there was a greater transparency and therefore uh, it had an impact on the corruption. So I mean, it's a constant effort to look at those kinds of strategies to reduce the corruption um, while also enabling systems to get stronger. Um, uh, on, the re on the resilience piece, you know, I, one of the things that I feel very passionate about is resilience is a shared goal of both relief and development. And I see it less of a transition approach, but rather a, a shared understanding that when you have resilient systems, you are absolutely able to withstand shocks, whether it's conflict, whether it's a virus. And we're seeing in, in um, West Africa, two countries that had very, very fragile systems and were quickly overcome, as opposed to what you see in Senegal and Nigeria, where they were able to mobilize and contain the spread of the virus. So that absolutely needs to be a shared goal and something that is thought about um, again, highly contextually specific as you move uh, in, uh, through these responses. In the, in the Ebola situation, um, you know, it's, it's a big, big challenge because that's a hugely expensive response on, for things that cannot be reused. You know, the protective personal equipment, for example, is a gigantic piece of the budget. However, w what I think about are three things that hopefully we'll be leaving behind. First is, a population that has moved light years ahead on sanitation practices. Uh, you, you know, I think that this has been a crash course in hand washing for, for those three countries. Secondly is a, a, a trained cadre of health workers um, that has been enhanced in what they've uh, been able to do. And thirdly, we're already looking at, at um, how to in, revitalize the healthcare system um, as a part of the, the next phase of the Ebola response, particularly in Liberia. Uh, ju just uh, about corruption, um, I, th I think, uh, you know, coming back with, uh, coming here with a, a strong uh, field background, I, I have to say that uh, we need to, to, to see what, what kind of corruption are we talking about? Are we talking about the big corruption at the, at the government level? Uh, or are we talking you know, about uh, people asking for money just uh, because otherwise they can't survive? At the hospital level, you know, the nurses, the doctors. So I think uh, corruption is something that we have discussed uh, throughout the project uh, um, with the angle of uh, um, medical ethics, ethics, ethical principles, and see what are the situations in which um, healthcare providers can be put in, in difficult situations. Some, some dilemmas are coming uh, on, on the issue of corruption. So don't want to go into details, but just to tell you that the project has tried to address that too. Concerning the um, re resilience, what, what you've been uh, Mentioning, I think it has to be said also that in some context, you know, if we look at Afghanistan, for instance, we, we can't behave in Afghanistan like if it was the first day. We, we are there for 30 years. And, uh, and there are probably within Afghanistan also zones of emergency, zones of, you know, probably good system, others that are in, in the development phase. It's, it's difficult to have, you know, just one image for such a complex situation, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, to be frank, I think health, we're not set up as MSF sort of to be where our expertise is in building systems or strengthening them. That said, in stable com situations, we do a ton of work in HIV, you know, drug-resistant tuberculosis, malaria, a lot, of, uh, a lot of areas that are relatively stable where we're oftentimes working with ministries of health you know, trying to uh, improve protocols and practice in the medical care field. So we're trying to do what we can there. Um, I think, you know, as I alluded to earlier, um, this concept of resilience is not something necessarily in the sort of wheelhouse of MSF, let's say. Um, and I think, you know, we kind of come back to the same point, whereas we have to acknowledge that right now we have an aid system that is 
highly overstretched and in many ways underperforming in a lot of aspects in the most critical crises. And we talk about resilience in the context of systems, I think, and that's very important. But we also have to acknowledge that you know, we face a situation, more refugees than we've probably had ever since the World War II. Um, we have people, individuals and communities that are arguably incredibly resilient. They're having to deal on their own for months at a time without anyone coming to assist them. And for me, that is, uh, and I think for MSF, that is the un unacceptable situation that we have right now, is, is that um, as we try and build those systems, there's no functioning state in, in, in Central African Republic, and there won't be for a long time. We have to acknowledge that. The mortality levels that we saw back in 2011, most of it largely from malaria, were catastrophic. They were emergency levels in an unstable environment. And I think um, for the aid community as such, we have to acknowledge that we need to be better at assisting those populations because they're demonstrating incredible resilience. The health workers that are staying in their communities developing are showing incredible resilience. I mean, we had a situation in South Sudan in Lear in, um, uh, in Uni State where um, we had to evacuate our hospital and we had, and this is our national staff, uh, you know, took patients uh, in an ambulance, uh, evacuated the hospital, the sickest. That hospital, that ambulance was, those ambulances were stopped armed groups took the, took the ambulances. They took them by stretcher bearer into the bush for months at a time with whatever medicine they had. Um, they tried to give the TB patients, the HIV patients who, who were there, medicine to last them as long as possible. I mean, this is individual acts, I think, and we see like refugees surviving countlessly without assistance, whether they be in, uh, you know, in, in Ethiopia coming over from South Sudan or a number of other places. And, and we just need to continue, at least from our perspective, to do that assistance better, to be there faster, to provide the needs as best as we can. And that's really, I think, uh, is really what is in some ways lacking and frustrating uh, for MSF as an organization right now. Um, and we acknowledge we're not in a good place to, to be telling, you know, building systems ourselves. That's that we've built ourselves to be responsive in other ways, and that can certainly be done by other organizations. We just see this critical gap right now. Well, I would love to continue the conversation, but um, our time has run out. Um, I think that um, a couple of the points that I've taken from this conversation are um, we need to be working harder to make sure that everybody across the globe understands who these actors are, what they're doing, what humanitarian response is, and celebrating the medical professionals and humanitarian workers who are out there doing this critically important work. Um, and we need to continue this conversation and make sure that we're doing everything we can to build a uh, trained, able, and willing workforce to go out and continue to do um, these missions uh, throughout the globe uh, while we continue to work on stopping the crises. Um, thank you very much to Nancy, to Bruce, and to Jason for coming and uh, being here today, and thank you all for listening. Thanks,